Thank you for joining us today as we look at the final psalm of the Psalter. Now, this is a short psalm, but it is the grand finale of praise. Interestingly enough, the first and last psalms of the Psalter have but six verses. The first psalm you remember well. It's a psalm of blessing. The last psalm is a psalm of praise. And I think we can easily recognize the propriety of having this psalm serve as the termination of the entire collection of psalms. For no psalm rises more grandly from verse to verse or comes to a conclusion in a nobler manner than this one, Psalm 150. In fact, 13 times in this short psalm, the verb praise is used. That verb in Hebrew is halal. That's why we call this the halal, the last five psalms of the book of Psalms. We call the halal because each one begins with hallelujah, and each one concludes with hallelujah, praise the Lord. Psalm 150 verse 1 says, praise the Lord. Well, all of these psalms do in the last part of the Psalter. But this one, hallelujah, is a call to praise. You know, to all who read this psalm, to all in heaven and all on earth, to all who are aware of the excellency of God's greatness, to all who have experienced his grace, to all who have been warmed by his love, this, my friends, this is an exhortation. Praise the Lord. This isn't a suggestion. This is what you and I ought to do if you have a relationship with God. And if that relationship is being renewed and restored and is growing day by day, then the outgrowth of that relationship is you will want to hallelujah. You will want to praise the Lord. So verse 1 of Psalm 150 is the call to praise, to remind each of us that we need to be thankful to the Lord God. Now, verse 1 also tells us the places of praise. Notice it says, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Now, this expression, praise God in his sanctuary, has been variously interpreted over the years. The Latin Vulgate, for example, renders it in his holy places. When Luther made his translation of the Bible, he said it means in holiness or in his holiness. And that Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament, called the Septuagint, it renders this verse, in his holy ones. I think the point is clear, however. We are to praise God in his holy sanctuary, in his holy places. We're to praise God in his holy ones. It's designed to indicate that God, the strong God, is to be praised in holiness, in the holiness of his temple, the holiness of his tabernacle the holiness of his church, and the holiness of the bodies of each of us who are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. A holy God is to be worshipped in a holy place. And you, friends, you and I, who are believers in Jesus Christ, each of us who has a relationship with the Lord God of heaven, we are that holy place. The Hebrew word for sanctuary here is kodesh, a sacred place, a consecrated place, a dedicated place, a place hallowed for holiness. Now, this, I think, tells me clearly that my body must be kept free from those things that would cause it to be unholy. I must not ingest or inject. I must not engage in any kind of activity which the Bible deems as unholy, unseemly, unnatural, unworthy of a believer. That's why many of the lifestyles that are viewed in the world today are unworthy lifestyles. Because anyone who wants to keep his or her sanctuary, his or her body, free from this kind of sin, anyone who wants the sanctuary of the body to be a hallowed place of holiness, a residence of God, cannot simply engage in the kind of things we see on television and on the movie screens today. So the call to praise is a call to worship God or praise God in his sanctuary, whether it's the temple, the tabernacle, or indeed, folks, our bodies. But there's a second place we can praise God, praise him in his mighty firmament. Now, this second specific location is the visible arch of the sky. It's the expanse of heaven. I think it's just a way of saying that we are to praise God in his sanctuary, which is on earth, 
regardless of what it means, and we're to praise God in his mighty firmament, which is in heaven, regardless of what that means. The point is, praise to the Lord God is to be made on heaven and earth. Praise to the Lord God is to be made throughout the universe because God is a God worthy of our praise. So verse 1 is the call to praise. Verse 1 is also the places of praise, telling us where we're to praise God. Verse 2 tells us the causes for praise. Why should we praise God? The answer to that question is found in the second verse. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Now, the mighty acts of God are those acts of his omnipotence in creation, in redemption, in sovereignty. Proverbs 3, verse 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Now, folks, there is no way to avoid the collision course between the humanistic, atheistic teaching of evolution and the Word of God. We can't avoid that course by pitting science against Scripture. We can't avoid the course because the Bible clearly says God is the creator of all things. And the humanistic, atheistic understanding of evolution says God doesn't exist. Therefore, God cannot create. If you're going to believe the Bible, you have to believe that in his omnipotence, God created and redeemed. In his sovereignty, he did it all. And if you believe that, there's real cause for praise to the Lord God. Nehemiah, in fact, tells the congregation of Israel, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. So we are to praise the Lord for his mighty acts, his acts of creation and redemption, his acts of sovereignty. But that's not the only reason you and I should be thankful to the Lord these days. Verse 2 tells us, Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Now, not only is God to be praised for his mighty acts, He's to be praised for being himself, for being excellent and being great. The word excellent here is the Hebrew word for abundant or huge, a multitude, plentiful. God is abundant. He is excellent. He is huge. And the word for greatness is the Hebrew word for stoutness, magnitude. We have a huge God of stoutness, a huge God of magnitude. We have a God with abundant stoutness. <laughs> now, I think this is terrific. You know, you and I live in a world in which fat is out and skinny is in. Have you noticed those people on television commercials? There isn't anybody in the world that's skinny. But I want to tell you, dear friends, that the Bible says we have a fat God, and I mean that very respectfully. We have a God of stoutness, a God of magnitude. Who wants a skinny God anyway? He is a stout God, a God plentiful in excellence. And we're to praise God because he is so huge. We're to praise him because he's huge in love. He's abundant in mercy. We're to praise God because of the kind of God he is. Yes, there are good reasons for you to praise the Lord today. And one of the great reasons is to remember that he is a God of excellent greatness. It was through that excellent greatness that he brought the Israelites safely through the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14. It was by that excellent greatness that Deborah and the Israelites were delivered from the host of Sisera. Judges chapter 4. And it's by that excellent greatness that we today are delivered from the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians chapter 2. Well, we've learned that we are to praise God. We've learned where we're to praise God. And we've learned why we are to praise God. What could be left? Verses 3, 4, and 5. These verses tell us about the instruments of praise. 
Now here we learn how we are to praise God in the glorious majesty of music, in the symphony of praise. Notice verse 3. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. The trumpet here is the shofar, the wind instrument, originally a ram's horn. The shofar was employed in making announcements or calling people together in a time of worship and a time of war. The word itself in Hebrew means bright or clear. And thus it was used as an instrument to give a clarion call for a special occasion. Today we would call this instrument a cornet. It was the shofar. It was the trumpet. Praise the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Now, take note of the full orchestra of instruments upon which we praise the Lord. First, there's the trumpet. Then also in verse 3, praise him with the psaltery or the lute. Originally, the word was used for a skin bag for liquids. And it became used as a lyre because the lyre used to have the body or the shape of this bag. This was a large portable instrument of ten strings. It was chiefly used in religious services. It was the kind of thing you would strike with a pick or a plectrum. Praise the Lord with the psaltery or the lute. And then he says, praise the Lord with the harp. The Hebrew word kinor for harp is the word we get the word kinneret. The Sea of Galilee is called the kinneret or the Sea of Chinnereth because it, well, it somewhat looks like it's heart-shaped. At least the ancients believed it was heart-shaped. This comes from a word meaning to twang, and it's the first musical instrument mentioned in the Bible. Genesis chapter 4, verse 21, one of Lamech's sons was named Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and the lute, those who twang away, if you will, on their harp and their lute. Verse 4, praise him with the timbrel and dance. Now, a timbrel was a percussion instrument, like the tabret or the tambourine today. It was struck with the hand. Basically, it had the same use it has today in music, for rhythm. So now we have a wind instrument, we have a stringed instrument, and here we have a percussion instrument. Notice also we're to praise the Lord with the dance. I mentioned yesterday that in the life of early Israel, dancing was one of the most expressive modes of religious joy. And while we don't find it repeated in the New Testament, these Old Testament Israelites knew how to praise the Lord with stringed instruments and dance. And verse 4 says, praise him with stringed instruments and flutes or pipes. Here, stringed instruments just simply means any instrument that has more than one string, multiple strings. Actually, the word is used twice in Hebrew, the same Hebrew word used back to back to indicate that there are many strings to this instrument. And then praise him with flutes or with organs, an instrument of reeds or of pipes. Also one of the first musical instruments mentioned in the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, verse 21. Likely, this was an instrument that had a collection of reeds. So, have you noticed, in our orchestra today, we're to praise the Lord with the sound of the trumpet, a wind instrument, and with the harp, a stringed instrument, with the timbrel, or a tambourine, a percussion instrument, and now we have a reed instrument. Notice verse 5. Praise him with loud cymbals. Have you ever watched at a symphony or perhaps at a children's symphony concert the person with the cymbals waiting to hit his note, staring intently, perhaps bobbing his head, counting out the rhythm until, well, his time comes, and then he slams those cymbals together? The word loud simply means to hear intelligently. In other words, it was so loud everybody could hear, nobody had a problem hearing these cymbals. The clanging, the clear sharp of the cymbals. Praise him with the loud symbols. Praise him with the high-sounding symbols. Probably finger symbols or castanets. Softer in pitch. Now this concludes the repertoire of the instruments upon which we're to praise the Lord. We've seen the call to praise, the places of praise, the causes of praise, and now the instruments of praise. What could possibly be left? Verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know, everything means literally everything. The whole of breath, every part, all the animals, every one that has breath is to praise the Lord. Our singing in church today is half-hearted. It's lackluster. It's dull. Friends, I think every time you sing praises to the Lord God, you ought to hurt yourself. You ought to expend all your energy. Use up all your breath. We're called upon to praise the Lord. What a grand and glorious day when you and I use our breath in no higher calling than the calling of hallelujah. 
praise the Lord. You are now at the end of this series of messages entitled Hallelujah! Psalms of Praise. 